When you're a kid, there's a kind of universal constant. Dinosaurs are cool. The thought of gigantic prehistoric creatures bigger than a car, some of them bigger than a house, sets imaginations running wild. And if you were a kid in 1993, there was nothing cooler than Jurassic Park. Based on a novel by Michael Crichton and directed by Steven Spielberg, it ushered in a new era of cinematic visual effects. Not to portray dinosaurs as monsters, but to bring them to life as real, living creatures. Special care was taken not just to make dinosaurs look good, but to show them fulfilling biological needs, like breathing and eating. Before Jurassic Park, dinosaurs were closer to mythological cartoon creatures like dragons or ogres, operating with human-like personalities and motivations. That wasn't good enough for Steven Spielberg, who wanted audiences to believe his dinosaurs were wild animals, with believable behavioral traits and instincts. This is even mirrored within the movie itself. John Hammond wants Jurassic Park's dinosaurs to be a piece of entertainment to be consumed, but he is unable to grasp the fact that real dinosaurs would be unpredictable forces of nature. That's all it is. All major theme parks had delays. When they opened Disneyland in 1956, mm -hmm. nothing worked. Yeah, nothing. yeah, but John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't eat the tourists. I can't wait anymore. This was the beginning of a new era for the dinosaur, both in the context of the movie and in the context of popular culture at large. The image of giant Godzilla-esque lizards was about to change forever. Jurassic Park was a colossal success. It was the beginning of a franchise empire with sequels and toys and comic books. Jurassic Park video games were everywhere on everything, and all were varied and unique. There's a weird point-and-click adventure game for the Sega CD, a light gun shooter for the arcades, and even a really weird management sim slash minigame collection for the 3DO, where you have to guide individual survivors to the rescue zone, and every space on the map is a different activity, like hiding from raptors or escaping from a rampaging T-Rex by driving a jeep. Jurassic Park for the 3DO even has Space Invaders and Galaga minigames, for some reason. It seemed as though no two Jurassic Park games were the same, running the gamut of the most popular genres of the era. But there's one Jurassic Park game that I think about a lot, even now. One game that I find incredibly interesting even in spite of itself. Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was developed by Ocean Software, a British company with an uneven history in gaming. They were primarily known for producing licensed games that tied into current films, TV shows, or comic books. Brits undoubtedly remember Ocean for their microcomputer output, with best-selling games like Robocop for the ZX Spectrum. But in the United States, their console releases were often found in the bargain bin, with a wide range of quick and dirty cash grabs like Cool World, Dark Man, and a game based on the live-action Flintstones movie with John Goodman. But despite this less-than-stellar reputation, Jurassic Park came out the other end being kind of a cool game, almost as if by accident, possibly hinting at Ocean's popularity across the pond. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In Jurassic Park, you play as Alan Grant, paleontologist, something of a cowboy, and now survivor of a high-tech theme park gone haywire. Gameplay is broken down into two separate modes. You start in an overworld segment, wandering about Isla Nublar shooting dinosaurs and collecting eggs, reminiscent of games like the Chaos Engine. Upon entering a building, Jurassic Park switches to a first-person perspective, this time similar to id Software's Wolfenstein 3D. At this point, Doom was right around the corner, set to release only a few weeks after Jurassic Park, and Ocean was looking to capitalize on that. Jurassic Park predates the Super Nintendo ports of both Doom and even Wolfenstein 3D, making this one of the few first-person shooters on the console at the time. This likely also explains the poor frame rate in first-person sections. Whereas the 1994 Super Nintendo port of Wolfenstein 3D runs fairly well, Jurassic Park borderlines on becoming a slideshow probably because it lacked the programming wizardry of id Software's John Carmack. 
But much like Doom and Wolf 3D, your goal here is to collect keys in order to open doors and progress through the game while blasting everything that moves. But here's the twist. Unlike id Software's games, which were a collection of discrete levels with beginnings, endings, and tally screens adding up completion times, Jurassic Park is more similar to an open world game. There are no levels, just one gigantic map, kind of like Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda. First person interiors are just another way to view the action. You can enter and exit them at your leisure, and interiors can connect two separate places on the overworld via secret tunnels. Exploring the island and learning its layout is half the fun. Even the ID keycard system plays into this. Whereas Doom simply had generic red, blue, and yellow keys recycled in every single level, Jurassic Park has nearly a dozen or so ID cards scattered across the entire island. Each one belongs to a character from the movie, hidden both inside and outside of buildings. Knowing where to find these ID cards and what doors they unlock is essential to progressing through the game. Though why paleobotanist Ellie Sattler's ID locks off an elevator in Jurassic Park's server room is anyone's guess. Your ultimate goal in all of this is to, of course, escape Jurassic Park, but it's not as simple as collecting all the ID cards and finding the final door that leads to rescue. Numerous other objectives must be dealt with first, like powering up the generator and rebooting Jurassic Park's computer systems. As you do this, new parts of the overworld map open up, and new technology like motion tracking radar becomes available, giving the game sort of a cool Metroid light vibe. There isn't tons of gear, and you don't really get too much stronger than you are at the start of the game, but it's just enough story and puzzle solving to break up the monotony of shooting endless numbers of velociraptors. But there's a reason Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo isn't remembered as some kind of all-time forgotten classic. Earlier I said the game was fun by accident, and that's because it's hard not to think of this game as being kinda clumsy. According to The History of Ocean Software by Chris Wilkins, Jurassic Park was originally pitched exclusively as a first-person shooter, but with only six months to create the game, the design document had to be scaled way back and its hurried development cycle is clear in many other ways. For starters, there's no easy way to check your current objective. Alan Grant seems to be alone on Jurassic Park, as there's no one else in the game to really talk to for information. You can get gameplay tips by walking up to these loudspeaker kiosks stationed around the island, but those tips can be vague and some of them aren't even relevant to what needs to be done to advance. A couple of them, like these messages from Dennis Nedry, even actively lie to you, telling you things that could get you killed. As a kid, I knew enough to power up the generator and head for the visitor center, but it wasn't until years later that I read a walkthrough and could figure out the rest of the game. Not only is there no easy way to see your current objective, but there's no way to even check where you are on the island. The map in Jurassic Park can only be viewed through computer terminals, and it too is vague at best. There's not really an easy way to view an inventory, and no way to see which doors you've checked or where they're located. All of that is pretty important information that the game should keep better track of, but you're on your own. I'm not asking for it to hold my hand or anything, but I'd at least like to know what keys I have and a map that gave me a general direction to head in. This is the sort of game that you need to play with a pen and paper close by to manually write down everything you've done so that you don't get lost. The biggest issue is one that is common in games by developers like Ocean. You cannot save your progress. This is a big game. The average completion time for your first playthrough will easily be six hours or more. My first time took me closer to nine hours, and that was with a walkthrough in hand. It's strange to think about now, but being able to save your progress in a console game was considered an expensive luxury back in 1993 especially for British game developers who were used to shipping games on rewritable computer floppy disks. Save data for Super Nintendo cartridges required additional microchips and separate backup batteries that added to production costs, so it wasn't uncommon for games to ship without the ability to record your saves, even by the mid-90s. Many games were at least kind enough to provide you with a password system to save your progress with, though, but Jurassic Park doesn't even give you that. 
This is less of a problem now with emulators and save states that let you resume progress from literally anywhere you stop playing, but back in 1993 it was a serious issue. If you had to turn the Super Nintendo off for any reason, all of your progress would vanish and you'd have to start back over from square one. What makes the lack of a save system extra bizarre is the fact that Ocean also included a scoring system and an arcade-style high-score leaderboard. If your game ends for some reason, either by escaping the island or getting a game over, you are forwarded to this high score screen to input your initials, that it also doesn't save. It's a super weird feature to include, but at least the music's funky. Oh yeah, and if you didn't catch it, Jurassic Park also has a lives system. Not only can you not save and resume, but if you die enough times, you'll get a game over and have to restart from the beginning of the game, undoubtedly losing hours of progress. Jurassic Park is an action game, but like Zelda and Metroid, it can be very slow and methodical, and being able to destroy an entire playthrough just because you ran out of 1-ups is baffling. There's one saving grace, and it's how the game treats item spawns. But even this will sound weird once you hear me describe it. Okay, so get this. When you're outside in the overworld, dinosaurs respawn every single time you exit a building. Let's say you're hiking to the power station from the entrance gates, and along the way you will encounter something like four velociraptors. If you kill them, they will stay dead until you enter the power station and then leave. On your way back through the jungle, you will encounter these same four raptors in the same places, and this will be true anytime you come through this trail after leaving a building. Kill all the dinosaurs, mess around in a tool shed, and everything outdoors will come back to life while you're inside. This, for whatever reason, is not true of weapons you find in the overworld. If you find shotgun rounds in the overworld, pick them up, and use them, that shotgun ammo is gone for the rest of the game. It never comes back. This creates a scenario where it can seem like there are unlimited dinosaurs, but a limited amount of weapons to defend yourself demanding ammo conservation kind of like an old-school survival horror game. But during first-person indoor segments, these rules actually get flipped around the other way. Dinosaurs you kill inside of buildings will stay dead forever, and now it's the ammo that infinitely respawns. What this means is that once you clear a building out, it kind of turns into a safe house, where you can always restock your weapons and replenish your health before venturing back out into the jungle. The biggest benefit to this spawning system is that a couple of buildings in the game contain secret 1-ups stashed in dark corners which respawn just like health and ammo. If you know where to go and are willing to do a little bit of grinding, you can effectively have infinite lives on top of infinite ammo. It's all about how much time you're willing to dedicate to farming resources by repeatedly ducking in and out of a safe house. There's also a creepy sort of atmosphere to these first-person segments. You'll naturally find yourself revisiting some buildings multiple times to check doors and refill resources. Due to a bug in their artificial intelligence, sometimes dinosaurs in nearby locked rooms will try to attack you through walls. Walking through what you thought was an empty visitor center, only to hear a raptor roar in the next room never ceases to set me on edge. And even if it's just a bug, it's a really cool one that creates a great spooky mood. this may all be, it makes for kind of a cool game, but once again I cannot stress how much it feels like a happy accident. Earlier I said that all Jurassic Park games were completely different from each other, and while that is mostly true, it's not the whole truth. Ocean Software developed no fewer than three Jurassic Park games. One for the Super Nintendo, an 8-bit version for the NES and Game Boy, and a computer version for Amiga and DOS. All three of them appear to be based on the same concept a top-down shooter where Alan Grant blasts dinosaurs, but with huge differences between them. Now, in 1993, game development was pretty different. 
Games were often made for one platform first, and if they sold well enough there, they'd make plans to release it elsewhere. But the hardware and the tools to make games was often so different that games often had to be outright rebuilt from scratch for every individual platform. This is why you'll run into scenarios where the arcade version of a game is significantly different from the home version, and things only get more complicated as you start talking about simultaneous releases. Konami, for example, had the license to Tiny Toons in the 1990s and released a multitude of games based on that franchise. All of them were developed within Konami at the same time, but all were developed by different teams for different platforms with different content. They may share some basic concepts, but are otherwise separate, unique games. Or what about Disney's Aladdin? Capcom developed the Super Nintendo version, but Virgin Games handled the Sega Genesis version, and both games are wildly different, sparking decades of debate among fans over which version is better. And here's a hint, it's the Super Nintendo version. The idea of a cross-platform game just did not really exist in 1993. Even Earthworm Jim, which developer Shiny actually boasted about being identical in quality between the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, still ended up having notable content differences depending on the platform. Which brings us back to the three versions of Jurassic Park developed by Ocean. All three are created from the same base concept, a top-down shooter starring Alan Grant, but anything beyond that and the similarities start to disappear. What's really interesting is how each game represents part of a spectrum. At one end, we have the 8-bit Jurassic Park, which pushes closer to traditional arcade action. Each level has you collecting eggs to receive key cards that unlock doors leading to the end of that level. There's a few guns, but they all seem to shoot these big green tennis balls. Gameplay is simple, levels seem to be relatively compact, and like I said earlier, it's just a very traditional game in the vein of arcade classics like Ikari Warriors or Commando, though much more sedate than either of those two. At the other end of the spectrum is the personal computer version of Jurassic Park, for DOS and Amiga. This attempts to approximate the movie more closely as you get lost in gigantic, maze-like maps and solve puzzles by finding and using items almost like an adventure game. For example, you need to enter the sewers, but you can't do that until you find the toolkit that lets you cut open the grate. If that's all it was, it might be fine, but endless numbers of dinosaurs and prehistoric bugs jump out of everywhere seemingly at random, and they're almost impossible to hit with any of your weapons. This also features a couple of first-person shooter segments, but like the rest of the game, it just feels very chaotic, sluggish, and confusing. It's probably the worst of Ocean's Jurassic Park efforts, even though by all accounts, computer systems like the Amiga were typically where they did their best work. But hey, at least the computer version of Jurassic Park supports password saves. Sitting square in the middle of the NES and computer versions is Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo. It's an action game, it's an adventure game, and all of it comes together into this weird mixture that kind of works. Or it almost works, I guess. Somebody somewhere at Ocean Software happened to stumble upon the right combination of feature mishmash that it accidentally coalesced into something near greatness. Not great in itself, but around the ballpark. Greatness adjacent. Which makes the game into kind of a bummer. With even just a couple of extra features, like a proper inventory screen to view collected key cards and the ability to save your game, Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo might have gone down as one of the secret classics of the system. Instead, Ocean seemingly carried the football all the way to the end zone and simply couldn't score a touchdown. Or, uh, I guess whatever the equivalent of that would be in soccer. Cause, you know, being British and all. but they simply did not have enough time to fully flesh out all of their ideas, and there were more licenses waiting to be cashed in on anyway. It's also once again important to keep in mind the era. I know it seems hard to believe, but in 1993 we just knew less about what made video games fun. Jurassic Park wasn't some sort of mysterious outlier, there were countless games with equally bizarre design decisions. Usually they were also attached to a film or TV license, but in some cases, games were just weird and clumsy and ugly. It's easy to look back on a game like Jurassic Park nearly 25 years later and see what it did wrong, but a lot of its ideas were probably made with the best intentions and some very educated guesses based on what was known at the time. This is clearly a game somebody put effort into and 
you can't fault them for trying. It's totally possible to still have fun with Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo as I have. All you need is the right frame of mind, an emulator with save states, and good old-fashioned paper and pencil. There's a weirdly tangible feeling to doing that, too. Sort of like why people go camping. You leave the modern world and get back in touch with a different time. In this current era of games giving you endless tutorials and instant gratification, playing a game that makes you write down basic information on paper can feel weirdly satisfying. Sure, yes, okay, it's not a great game. Even by the standards of 1993, it had major problems preventing people from truly appreciating its coolest ideas. And technologically speaking, parts of it have aged rather poorly. But more than being a good or bad game, it is an interesting game. It may not have some of the most friendly game design, but there's not much else like it on the Super Nintendo. Or anywhere else, for that matter. Maybe I was just in the right place at the right time for Jurassic Park Mania to hit me in full force, but that doesn't explain why so many other Jurassic Park games bounced off me. There's just something special about Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo. From the chunky character sprites, open-ended gameplay, moody first-person shooter segments, and the funky music by composer Jonathan Dunn. It may not stick the landing on all of its ideas, but we will probably never get an experience like this ever again, and for that, I will always remember it. Hey, you made it to the end of the video, good job! I know I haven't done a retro game review in a really long time, and I haven't even done a new edited video since this time last year. I want to apologize for that, but with this year being the way it has been, it's just been very difficult for me to focus on big picture projects. This was a script I wrote years ago when I moved away from Colorado, and I figured it would be fast and easy to put together. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, maybe you could consider dropping a like or subscribing to my channel. You could also head on over to my Patreon and give that a look. I know you're probably tired of hearing people shill their Patreons, but if you like what I'm doing, Patreon donors occasionally get exclusive bonus content when it's available. It also really, genuinely helps me out. If it wasn't for my Patreon donors, some of the videos I've made over the last few years might not even exist, and with this horrible year being what it is, YouTube and Patreon are becoming increasingly important to my well-being. Eternal thanks to JackalZXA, Gabriel, Minka Cola, Melko Driggs, DJ Yoshiman, This Dorky Guy, Juan, Rose S, Keith S, Setsune, Connor F, L, Thomas B, Gamer, Fiesta, L, a different one this time, Stephen D, Sam B, Ryan L, Tekokami, Logan A, Ashley J, and Anders O. I am always surprised and delighted by the amount of faith they have in me. If you'd like to join their ranks, head on over to patreon.com slash blazehedgehog to learn more. There's also free content for you to browse and links on other ways you can support what I'm doing without donating to Patreon. And lastly, before I leave you guys, DJ Yoshiman donated to Patreon so that I could shout out an indie game known as Psy Cutlery. It's an indie platformer starring a cute girl in a frog costume who might actually be an alien? She's friends with a psychic spork, and together they go on a very strange, unique adventure across the planet. Even before Yoshi Man asked for a shoutout, Psy Cutlery is a game I'd had my eye on for a while, because it's from the same developer as an old fan game known as Psycho Waluigi. Psy Cutlery is kind of the next evolution of that same concept, and it looks adorably weird. Definitely head on over to eyesineverything.com and give the game a look. It's due out in 2021. Anyway, that's all from me. See you in the next video. Uh, eventually.